I have the distinguished pleasure of welcoming uh, one of our most prominent foreign policy expert alumnus back to campus today, and that is uh, Ambassador Kenneth Juster. Ambassador Juster recently completed his service as a 25th U.S. Ambassador to the Republic of India, uh, where he served from 2017 to 2021. Uh, while in that capacity, he oversaw the third largest U.S. mission in the world and one of the most vital partnerships that we have with the world's largest democracy. Uh, in that capacity, he also oversaw and expanded the U.S. relationship with the Kingdom of Bhutan, with which the United States does not currently have formal diplomatic relations. And for his service, he received a number of awards. I'm just going to list a few of them. Those included the Secretary of State's Distinguished Service Award, the Defense Department's Distinguished Public Service Award, the Director of National Intelligence's Exceptional Service Award, and the Department of Energy's Excellence Award. So needless to say, um, we are very grateful for his service uh, as our, our ambassador. Um, and we're looking forward to what he has to say about the U.S.-India relationship. Um, he currently serves as the senior counselor at Freshfields Brookhouse Derringer, as a distinguished fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations, and also as a senior advisor at CDPQ. Um, he's also served uh, in the private sector in a number of distinguished roles, including uh, at Warburg Pincus, uh, at Salesforce.com, and also at the law firm of Arnold and Porter. Um, in addition, uh, he, prior to his service as ambassador, he has a distinguished career, uh, having served the U.S. government in a number of different capacities uh, in the Trump administration, the George W. Bush administration, and the George H. W. Bush administration. I'm just going to list some of those as well, just to give you a sense of the breadth of expertise of our distinguished speaker here today. Uh, he served as the Deputy Assistant to President for International Affairs on both the National Security Council and the National Economic Council prior to being appointed as the Ambassador. Um, he served as the Under Secretary of Commerce from 2001 to 2005. Uh, and then in the uh, George H.W. Bush administration, he served as the Deputy and Senior Advisor to the Deputy Secretary of State, as well as the Counselor to the State Department. So needless to say, uh, Ambassador Juster is someone who has seen it all, uh, whether this is through the eyes of various different administrations, uh, through uh, the public sector as well as the private sector in finance, technology, and in law. But most of all, we are proud to call him one of our own. Uh, he graduated from Harvard College in 1976 with a degree in government, Phi Beta Kappa. And then he also graduated with a JD from Harvard Law School, as well as an MPP from Harvard Kennedy School in 1979. And he has then since gone on uh, prior uh, to uh, serving in government and in the private sector. He also clerked uh, for Judge James Oaks on the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. Uh, so with that, please join me in welcoming back Ambassador Ken Juster. Well, thank you very much, Mark, for those very generous comments. Uh, it's once been said that uh, anyone who doesn't appreciate flattery has never experienced it. So <laughs> thank you uh, for that. Uh, it's really nice to be here back at Harvard and see all of you, but especially uh, I did graduate in 1976 from college. I'm glad to see one of my professors, Ralph Parberg, who uh, was both a tutor and a, a senior ad advisor for my senior thesis, and Bill Alford, who was in law school with me a couple of years ahead in the East Asian Legal Studies program, is now here uh, as well. And I'm delighted to be joined by my wife, uh, Elisa, who's here, and uh, again, a number of others who I've uh, worked with and met over the years. Uh, Mark had asked me to make a few opening comments on uh, how China has affected the U.S.-India relationship, or if it has affected it, and if so, how, and also the evolution of something known as the Quad, which is a grouping among China, among the United States, India, Australia, and Japan. So let me comment on really China's role in, in uh, those two, in the bilateral relationship and the Quad. 
Uh, when the United States and India really began to transform its relationship, which was at the end of the term of uh, President Clinton when he traveled to India, before, before then the countries had had a cordial but somewhat cool relationship during the Cold War. Uh, India was uh, non-aligned. It was uh, a closed economy for a good period of time and it was a socialist country. And uh, the United States provided assistance to it, agricultural assistance, health assistance, but didn't have a overly warm relationship because the United States in part was an ally of Pakistan, which had had the uh, uh, problems in uh, separating and partitioning with India in 1947. And India, while it was non-aligned, ultimately uh, signed a friendship treaty with Russia in 1971 and got most of its military equipment from Russia. Also in 1962, even though India thought it would have a very productive relationship with China as these two countries had emerged from the colonial period, uh, China invaded India and there was a war in 62 that certainly uh, uh, undercut a lot of the warmth in that relationship, though over time they worked out uh, various modus operandi and, and were having a reasonably productive relationship until I'll mention some incidents uh, during my time as ambassador. But when the United States uh, and India started to warm the relationship uh, at the end of Clinton's term, and recall that in 1998 India had set off some nuclear devices that led to worldwide sanctions against it, so there was a lot of uh, mistrust and uh, lack of warmth in the relationship. Uh, but Clinton made the first trip of a president to India in uh, decades and uh, created a, a series of uh, warm feelings. And this was also at a time when the number of Indian Americans was increasing. India played a role in what was called Y2K and working on our IT systems to make sure they didn't all go down at the turn of the century. Uh, and then when Bush came into office, George W. Bush, he and the Indian Prime Minister Vajpayee both thought that the world's oldest democracy, the United States, and its largest democracy, India, should have a better relationship. And Vajpayee even said that the countries were natural allies, even though India eschews the notion of having an alliance with uh, anyone. And so they began the transformation of the relationship. And I, at the time, was Under Secretary of Commerce in charge of ind issues where industry and uh, national security, business and national security, intersected, including controls of sensitive U.S. technology, what's called dual-use technology that has both a military and civilian application, and something that countries, including India, want to get increased access to to help their economic development. So I was involved in uh, creating a high technology cooperation group that I co-chaired with India's foreign secretary, and then an initiative called the Next Steps in Strategic Partnership that really put together a series of reciprocal steps the two countries could tape, take to enhance cooperation, not just in high technology, but civil space issues, civil nuclear issues, and civil defense issues. And this ultimately led to a civil nuclear deal in uh, 2008. While this transformation took place, both India and the United States had pretty good relations with China. Uh, as you may recall, the United States was instrumental in China's membership in the World Trade Organization in 2001. And both of our countries engaged in trade uh, and interaction with the Chinese. It is true that some people in the U.S. government felt that strengthening U.S.-India relations was a hedge against a possible worsening of U.S.-China relations, but that was not really the primary motivation. It was more, as I said, the fact that our countries just had so much in common that we should have a better relationship overall. And there was the people-to-people -people element that spurred that on. And for American business, India was a potential huge market and was opening up uh, also. And so the U.S.-India relationship made sense on its own terms. I think the United States also felt that a strong India would be important in Asia and as a balancer of whatever other developments might occur there. And a strong U.S.-India relationship made sense because inevitably over time, India already was going to be uh, and now is the world's largest country in terms of population, but was going to be a large economy and we should have a better relationship with them than we did. 
Uh, in 2004, India, the United States, Japan, and Australia worked collectively uh, to provide humanitarian assistance and disaster relief in the wake of a tsunami that had affected Asia. And that led in 2007, really at the impetus of former and the late Prime Minister Abe of Japan, for the formation of something called the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue, in which these four countries would get together to discuss mutual issues uh, in the region of, of concern. Well, the Chinese promptly uh, criticized this grouping. They, it was termed an Asian NATO in an effort to contain China, and in 2008, it disbanded. Uh, India has a 2,000-plus mile border with China. It's undefined. It's called the line of actual control. But they didn't want to have any uh, uh, conflictual elements of that relationship and were very sensitive to China's concerns. And Australia was very sensitive as well and had a deep sort of economic relationship. I think Japan and the United States also had good relations, but they uh, were less uh, perhaps affected by China's uh, uh, criticisms, but all four said that this grouping should not continue if it's going to create that type of uh, reaction. When I was ambassador in 2017, we worked with the Japanese to revitalize uh, the Quad, and India and Australia agreed, and we had meetings at the working group level, the assistant secretary and ambassadorial level, uh, for the first couple of years of my term. And then in 2019 and 2020, these meetings were elevated to the ministerial level. And so the foreign ministers got together, including an in-person meeting in 2020, October of 2020 in, uh, in Tokyo. And the Biden administration has uh, further expanded this to have summit meetings at the leadership level that began in 2021. And the agenda for the Quad has gradually expanded. It is explicitly not focused on security issues. In fact, people in the media still refer to it as the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue. You will never see an official document come out of this group that uses that terminology. It just refers to itself as the Quad. Uh, and it has explicitly stated it is not directed at China. It is not directed at anyone. It's designed to create a positive agenda for the region, focused primarily on public goods, on things such as how to provide vaccine uh, relief and health uh, security for countries in the region, how to make sure that uh, there's better cyber security, how to work on resilient supply chains, how to help advance critical and emerging technologies. There is uh, a working group on maritime domain awareness but explicitly they do not deal with defense issues. Uh, and yet, China and Russia have reacted very negatively to it. And there's no doubt that this grouping is uh, designed to help create what they would refer to as a free and open Indo-Pacific with freedom of navigation, freedom of overflight, peaceful resolution of disputes. There's been some concern that China's Belt and Road Initiative has created unsustainable debt burdens on recipient countries, with Sri Lanka being an example of that. And so this grouping is trying to provide quality infrastructure and financing uh, for that. Uh, and they believe in the peaceful resolution of disputes, as I may have mentioned, and also, most importantly, in importance of sovereignty and territorial uh, integrity. Uh, and so that's what's really been the impetus here. And one has asked the question, why did this group that disbanded in 2008 come together in 2017? And I've heard the Indian Foreign Secretary succinctly say it's because there is greater strategic clarity today about the rise of China than there was in 2008, where there was a range of perspectives. And now I think there is concerned by these countries that some of the principles I just referred to for a free and open Indo-Pacific may not be fully shared uh, by uh, every country in the region, in particular China. And so that clarity has brought them together. And then in 2020, uh, 
there was a major clash between India and China on this area called the line of actual control, uh, in which, uh, from the Indian perspective, China had come across what was viewed as territory that uh, uh, should not be infringed on, uh, and it ultimately led in June of that year to casualties for the first time in 45 years. 20 Indian troops were killed uh, by Chinese, and at least four Chinese troops were killed. Well, this shattered, from the Indian perspective, the trust in the relationship. Uh, there had been an earlier incident in 2017 in the Doklam Plateau, that's part of Bhutan, where Bhutan, China, and India come together. Bhutan is a small country nestled between the two, but this is a strategic area overlooking the small strip of India that connects the major subcontinent with the part of India that's on the eastern side of Bangladesh, uh, and it's connected by what they call the chicken's neck, and the Doklam region looks down on it, so if the Chinese were to occupy that from the Indian perspective, that would be a vulnerability. So there was a standoff for 73 days, and finally they were able to work out uh, de-escalation, but this incident in 2020 has led to major tensions where you have on each side 50 to 60,000 troops digging in, building permanent infrastructure with heavy artillery. And this is in godforsaken territory that's 15, 16,000 feet up in the Himalayas. Some of it is really not uh, uh, strategic in any sense of the word. It's very difficult uh, to maintain uh, people up there, and yet they have this uh, tension right now, and that clearly in my mind has further accelerated uh, the developments in the Quad and the expanse of the agenda there, but again without any explicit statement that it's in uh, response to developments in China. As to the U.S.-Indian relationship, as I said, that has continued to grow in advance uh, since the period I described earlier and has been one of the few areas of bipartisan support despite all the polarization in Washington. Both Democratic and Republican administration have viewed this as an important relationship and it's also been one that's had support in India as political parties have uh, changed. And therefore, it's been a strong relationship, but I would say again during my time, and certainly uh, in more recent years, the degree of activities that we're engaged in, which has expanded to include every issue of human endeavor, whether it's defense cooperation, counterterrorism, nonproliferation, trade, investment, energy, the environment, health care, agriculture, education, space, oceans. We work on everything, not as allies, but as partners. But that work is intensified even further as some of this strategic clarity presented by the rise of China has uh, become evident. Uh, and for example, uh, we concluded during my time three major defense agreements called foundational agreements relating to secure communication, sharing of geospatial data, uh, industrial cooperation, and implementing some logistics uh, cooperation that had been on the table for 10 years. Uh, and we enhanced our uh, uh, exercises, our military exercises, to make them more complex, to have a naval exercise that included the four countries of the Quad, uh, to have military personnel stationed in exchange at each other's military uh, command uh, places. Uh, and so defense cooperation increased. We had more strategic dialogues. That we've created something called the two plus two. Uh, for defense and uh, foreign ministers to meet uh, each year and have working meetings in between. Uh, we adopted this concept of the Indo-Pacific Indo and a free and open Indo-Pacific and enhanced our energy cooperation and energy security and uh, healthcare cooperation and, and as I said across the world. And I got to believe that part of that was because we feel it made sense on its own terms and part of that was because of concerns about developments that were coming out of, uh, out of China. And as I said, I think that has only uh, been more evident in uh, uh, 
uh, recent years uh, under the Biden administration. So the U.S.-India relationship has progressed strongly on its own and makes sense on its own terms. Uh, but I think the rise of China has added to its uh, enhancement. But I would conclude by saying, you know, India and the United States have a confluence of interest in a lot of areas, but we're partners, we're not allies. India believes in strategic autonomy. It has a slightly different vision of the world order. It believes in a multipolar world. It would like to reform a lot of today's institutions so it has a greater voice in them. It believes they are, don't reflect the current uh, distribution of power in the world. The United States supports some of this, but we may not see eye to eye on all of it. And that's been most evident in Russia's invasion of Ukraine, where India has taken a very different position than we have, in part because of its own historical relationships and its desire to <coughs> maintain a good relationship with Russia and try to keep Russia from getting any closer to China, although I think that's a uh, difficult uh, thing to do at this point. Anyway, let me stop there, and I'm delighted to uh, have a conversation with you or take any questions that people may have. Thank you. Thank, Thank you so you much, Ambassador. Uh, I will take my prerogative as the moderator to ask the first question, and then I will open up to the floor for others. Uh, just a reminder, uh, when you ask your question, please identify yourself. Um, the question I want to ask, Ambassador, is you laid out in your talk um, various ways in which India is engaging with the U.S. and how China uh, is impacting that, um, including the Quad 2 plus 2 and the various uh, channels uh, and dialogues that we've set up. But at the same time, um, India is also engaging with China in a variety of different fora as well, most notably the BRICS, uh, which started out uh, just Russia, India, China, right, geared towards the U.S. and the Western liberal order. Uh, but then also um, through the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, through the New Development Bank, and a number of other channels here as well. Um, how should we understand what's happening there, and how has perhaps what's happened in those type of fora also affected the U.S.-India relationship? Well, that's a great question, uh, Mark. As I mentioned earlier, India believes in a multipolar world, and it very much wants to be friends with all uh, countries in, in the world. It doesn't want there to be a bipolar uh, China-India a China-United States split. And in fact, it worked with Russia and China to form what's called RIC in the late 1990s uh, because they didn't want there to be a unipolar world uh, dominated by the United States. And that RIC group grew to become the BRIC group when Brazil joined it. And Goldman Sachs said, here are four major emerging economies. Today, of course, they're not all such strong uh, economies, and it expanded to include South Africa in 2010, and now recently uh, met, and there are over 20 countries that are seeking to become members of the BRICS. Uh, the United States, quite frankly, was not sure that that group would expand as opposed to providing criteria for expansion. It was rumored that China wanted to see it expand, and Russia did. But India and Brazil were more reluctant. They thought it might dilute its position. Uh, the Chinese viewed that this might be more of an anti-Western grouping. Uh, in any event, when they met in August, they announced an expansion to six more countries, Egypt, Ethiopia, Argentina, the United Arab Emirates, uh, and then Saudi Arabia and Iran, countries that didn't necessarily uh, get together. And Again, some interpreted this as a power play by China to have gotten these other influential countries involved in the group, and it would be viewed as an anti-Western group. India would say quite the contrary, that it's more of an indication that what's called the Global South, or countries that are not part of the G7 and sort of the Western structure, want to have more of a say in international affairs and want better representation, and while the idea that this will be a coherent group in terms of policy measures is, I think, a difficult one given the rivalries that you have between, as I said, Saudi Arabia and Iran, Egypt and Ethiopia, and India and China, 
right now. It does represent a voice for countries that are not always as well represented in global institutions. And so from India's perspective, this is part of uh, the multipolar world that it supports, part of it feels it's the voice of the global south, and it was the president uh, pre during its presidency, which goes on for the rest of this year, of the G20. It made a big point of being the voice of the global south, of expanding membership of the G20 to include the African Union. Uh, and so from their perspective, this is consistent with its vision of foreign policy in a multipolar world. Uh, the U.S. may have been a little surprised by the expansion, but we understand it and accept it. And we don't expect that India will only be in groupings with the United States. Uh, it's in other groupings. You mentioned the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. And this is also a way for India to have an influence in these organizations that we feel will be uh, a positive one. So this is part of the broader, in my opinion, change we're seeing in the, in the global system. I mean, it's, our attention has been riveted the last few weeks on uh, the awful, horrific uh, incidents that occurred in Israel on October 7th and the Israeli response in the war now that's going on there. But in my opinion, that's indicative of a broader uh, amount of flux and fragmentation that's occurring in today's world order. Uh, and ultimately, it's going to lead, I think, to a resetting of the world order, to new alignments and relationships that are occurring, to reforms of uh, global institutions and new distributions uh, of power. And I think it's not that different from the period we saw at the end of World War II or at the end of the Cold War. And you see it throughout the world. You see it in Europe with Russia's invasion of Ukraine which is something we couldn't have imagined a few years ago. And you have one of the permanent members of the Security Council undermining all the principles behind the founding of that institution. Uh, you have the expansion of NATO to include Finland and soon to include Sweden and greater unity than we've seen in years in NATO. In the Middle East, before the recent episodes, we have seen the Abraham Accords and Israel's normalization with the UAE and with Bahrain and its subsequent normalization with Sudan and Morocco. We saw uh, this new grouping called the I2U2, India uh, and Israel and the UAE and the United States to work on economic and technology and health issues. Uh, we've seen uh, China come into the region with its brokering of an agreement between Saudi Arabia and Iran to restore relations. And we saw the U.S. trying to broker uh, an effort to normalize relations between Saudi Arabia and Israel. Hopefully what's occurring now may lead to a greater effort to have a more permanent peace in the region, but it could undo all of what I've just referred to. And as I said, we see, I think, the most systemic change is occurring in the Indo-Pacific with uh, the rise of China, the rise of India, and how the world will respond to that with the BRICS expansion, uh, with Japan and Korea coming together uh, in ways that they haven't uh, reconciled in recent years, with the U.S. working with the United Kingdom or Australia on an initiative called AUKUS, uh, and, and a whole range of uh, developments, uh, the Quad included, that, as I said, I think will, will reset the world order over the next several years and how this all plays out will be, you know, we don't know for sure. And, and China, India, the United States are going to be big actors in, in all of that. So I'll invite you, if you have a question, please raise your hand and please wait for the microphone. <coughs> Yes, my name is George Ogay from Cheshire Investments in Austin. The difference in per capita uh, income growth rates between India and China over the past 25 years has really been very, very significant. And there are a lot of reasons for that, uh, including a development economic strategy that China pursued of trying to attract foreign direct investment. 
My question is, given the rise of China and that economic power uh, is a source of military power, how is that impacted? India is thinking about its overall development economic strategy and specifically the role of uh, foreign investment and joint ventures in liberalizing the economy more broadly speaking. Thank you for that question, uh, George. There's no doubt that, you know, if you go back to the beginning of the 1980s, India and China were pretty much at the same level uh, economically, and then China really opened up, attracted investment, and uh, traded, and uh, it's fivefold, you know, the size of the Indian uh, economy, and the gap is enormous, and it poses major strategic challenges for India, and the Indians are very much aware of that and would like to expand their growth. It's one of the reasons why I think they're working closely with our country on critical and emerging technology issues. They want to cooperate in semiconductors and artificial intelligence and quantum computing. Uh, coming out of COVID, uh, the whole notion of resilient supply chains has become part of our uh, everyday talk now. Uh, earlier when I went to school or was in government, no one talked about supply chains, I guess, after the end of cold, the Cold War. For companies, you went to the most economically efficient place to source your parts and components. Uh, but now, uh, people are concerned about critical dependencies and want trusted partners for their supply chains. And India wants to position itself as an alternative supply chain to uh, China. And India is making a big push to try to attract foreign investment. It's uh, creating production uh, linked incentives in uh, certain sectors. Uh, and so it recognizes that this is a, uh, an important need for it. And whereas China has an old country in terms of its demographics, India has 65 percent of its population under the age of 35. It has to create jobs and have a growing economy. And Quite frankly, even growing at 6% doesn't create the 1 million jobs a month that it needs to do. They need to grow maybe at 8 or 9%. So they are very conscious of this, but they also adopt some policies that, in my opinion, aren't optimal for this type of growth. Uh, and they've tried to attract investment, but they do it in part by keeping high barriers to trade. And they have relatively high tariffs. Uh, and they have other uh, regulatory matters that uh, make it harder to trade. And they feel that incentivizes countries to invest in their country because they can't trade with their country. But I would submit that for com companies to invest, you've got to feel that there's trade in and out so you can get parts and components and other things. They've cut some deals. Apple has now established a big manufacturing facility in India and has gotten India to agree that some of its Chinese subcontractors can locate in India to, to provide uh, parts and components for what it's doing. But it's still uh, not as easy to do business there. India has wanted, as have other countries, to capitalize from uh, Western companies that are deciding not to invest further in China and are looking elsewhere. It has captured some of that, but so is Vietnam, so is Indonesia, so are the Philippines and other countries in Southeast Asia. And India has not captured as much as they can. And I think one of the other things holding it back, and I also think it holds back the United States, is they're not part of the regional trade structure. Uh, India had been in, in negotiations for seven years to become a member of the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, which originally was going to have 16 countries in the region, including all of the ASEAN, Southeast Asian countries. And it pulled out uh, at the last minute, in part because it thought it was going to be subordinated to China and the organization was meant to benefit China. Uh, but it's not part of it. And the United States had been uh, a major player in the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement, and it pulled out. Uh, in the first day of the Trump administration, by the way, a decision that had no one involved in it other than the president making this because one of his advisors brought in a piece of paper, but the National Security Advisor and the National Economic Advisor, myself and others, had no idea this was occurring. It was a strategic mistake because 
if you were concerned about the rise of China, you couldn't have done anything more uh, to give them a greater voice and us a diminished one and say, we're going to pull out of the regional trade structure and China's the major dominant player in regional trade. Uh, virtually every country in the region has its leading trade partner being China and they have the Belt and Road Initiative, et cetera. So India is trying desperately to uh, attract more investment and to increase its growth so that it can close the gap with China. And it's taken a number of positive steps to do that. It's investing tremendously in infrastructure, which is a challenge for companies. But it still is doing a few things that I think don't help it. It's hard to be an alternative supply chain if you don't have free trade agreements with the other countries uh, uh, that can provide those parts and components. It does have an agreement with ASEAN, but being part of the regional trade structure would be different. And it still maintains uh, some high barriers uh, or high tariffs, relatively high tariffs and barriers to trade. Recently, the last comment I'd make is the United States, for whom trade has also become a domestic problem and has not put forward new agreements. And I think I, I'm fully sensitive to the fact that trade can cause displacements that we have to be sensitive to. We have to be smart about what we put in trade agreements. We have to provide transition assistance to those who are negatively affected. But to simply forego trade is to forego, I think, economic growth. Uh, uh, countries benefit from both imports create jobs and exports uh, create jobs. Uh, and because it's a, I think there are people in the administration who understand the importance of trade, but also understand the domestic constraints, they put forward the Indo-Pacific Economic Framework which has four pillars, one relating to supply chains, one to tax and corruption, one to, uh, I think, climate issues, and one to trade. But we announced at the outset that the trade pillar will not involve any market access or market opening measures, which, of course, is what other countries want, is access to the U.S. market, and they make concessions in return for that access. And so while we have 13 other countries that have signed up to participate, I think no one has high expectations for the impact on trade because of these constraints. And India, which is participating in three of the four pillars, is not participating in the trade pillar. They're taking more of a wait and see attitude. So it's a long answer to your question. India is very cognizant of the problem. It's trying to do things uh, to address it. But it also has this notion of self-reliance uh, that uh, I think sometimes works against it. Um, my name is Jin. Uh, I'm a Fairbank Center research affiliate. My question has to do with um, a, a sort of cottage industry, a research industry, 20 years ago, about 20 years ago. Um, people were studying um, comparison between India and China. The, under the title, uh, compare the dragon with the elephant. And about 20 years ago, the, there was a strong view that even though India was behind China in terms of its uh, GDP or GDP per capita, but in the long run, because of its uh, democratic system, uh, because its um, uh, demographic uh, population advantage, in the long run, um, India would be more resilient, would have more potential to outgrowth uh, China, to outcompete China. So now it's 20 years later. What is your assessment on the economic resilience and economic potential and economic efficiency between the two, two countries. Well, again, Especially in yeah. terms of infrastructure, in terms of the um, uh, business op operation environment. Yeah. How do you compare these two countries vis-a-vis -vis a sort of consensus about this topic 20 years yeah. ago? Well, I think that's an excellent question. And I think people were very insightful 20 years ago because part of that may be playing out. We've seen in China an authoritarian system, President Xi sort of cracked down on 
uh, the technology sector, the big successful companies, and put more emphasis on the state-owned enterprises. And China now is suffering uh, economically, also because of the COVID uh, crisis and the uh, shutdown that occurred during that time because of the real estate bubble that has burst, but also because some of the entrepreneurship in that country is being, in my opinion, stifled by measures of the state where they don't want any private company to be too successful and get too big. Uh, and therefore, there's now speculation that, you know, China, it'll be a long time before China becomes the world's largest economy. And uh, there's concerns of a slowdown there that will have perhaps unfortunate collateral effects on the world economy. India, on the other hand, uh, has a very strong entrepreneurial spirit. Many Indians come to this country and uh, end up leading our high-tech companies. Uh, I've always argued that India should make the domestic environment more conducive to keeping them there, but they put a huge emphasis on startup technology. They have a lot of what are called unicorns, private companies that are worth over a billion dollars. They have an incredibly dynamic technology sector in Bangalore and Hyderabad. And they're now putting a huge emphasis on working with the United States and other countries on critical technologies. Uh, and so they are cultivating a huge entrepreneurial uh, class and, and growth. They're working hard on uh, educational exchanges in this area. They're working hard to increase their infrastructure. And there is a dynamism of the democracy that you see. And so it may well be that if we were having this discussion 10 years from now, you will see China that has stagnated more than one expected. And there was a certain brittleness to its uh, economic progress. And India, which uh, is a bit messier, it doesn't make decisions as strategically. Uh, and things may always appear to be less efficient than optimal, still has a dem demographic uh, 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 advantage and an entrepreneurial spirit and advantage and a ecosystem and culture that allow it to uh, grow uh, more effectively. Now, as I said in my previous question, I think a few tweaks could make it even better, but the growth is still there and you see you know, over 2,000 U.S. companies investing in India and people making bets that even if it doesn't happen tomorrow, it's going to happen over the longer term and be successful. And India has a strong incentive to increase its ease of doing business, which it has worked on and done well on, and to attract more and more uh, investment. So it may not have occurred as quickly as one thought 20 years ago, but I do think those trends are very much evident today. Professor Alford. Thanks. Thanks again so much for coming and thank you for supporting students from Harvard University with the Justice Fellows Program. It's a really great idea. Um, a, a, a couple parts of my question too. It, it, it seems um, India wants to join it, it, every organization, it seems. It wants to have their own Security Council seat. It, it's uh, in this new standard grouping you mentioned. Uh, yet at the same time, as you also mentioned with regard to trade, the, the, the tariff laws remain hard for investment. Is there, either in the government or in other circles in India, uh, some kind of affirmative vision of what the new global order would be like, you know, post WTO? Um, you know, one likes to think that uh, not just size, but, but in terms of contributing ideas to the world, uh, there might be something coming out of. Of, of India in that regard. So it'd be interesting to hear. And secondly, much more, two other small subparts, a, a much more minor question. I'm wondering what's up with the generic pharmaceuticals industry that India was so important in prior to the pandemic, but then retrenched on its many of its commitments to supply those. And is that still vibrant? And third, just in the United States, it seems to me we're so. <clears throat> We're ignorant about China, but boy, we're even more ignorant about India, it seems to me, and how. How does one begin to dispel that? Anyway, thank you. 
Well, when you get three questions, you can pick and choose in terms of the ones you want to uh, And you only get three questions answer. if you're a professor. Right. Uh, you know, there may well be some blueprint for the future global order. I have not aware of it, but at a, at a broader level, as I said, India believes in a multipolar world in which that is a way that it will have more uh, ability to play a, uh, a more significant role. And ultimately, it sees itself as the bridge between the north and the south and the east and the west. It sees itself as a country that has, as I said, good relations with all. Uh, if they felt the time was right, they might be able to play a role in uh, resolving the Russia-Ukraine issue. The time isn't right at this point. Uh, but you see that they want this vision where Russia, China, India, the United States, uh, Brazil, others are all important players and they have a positive relationship with them and they want the institutions of global governance to better reflect this vision of a multipolar world in which India should be playing a more significant uh, role. Uh, in terms of the uh, generics, I mean, India has companies that are tremendous in producing generic drugs or uh, vaccines at uh, high uh, levels and capacity. I'm not sure that that has changed at all or dissipated. I'm not, I'm not fully sure you know, what specific things you're referring to, but that is a strong suit of it, of its, and the United States is agreed to work with India on ways to increase vaccine distribution and drug distribution in ways that are hopefully not incompatible with intellectual property rights uh, at the same time. And then your third question was? More oh, yeah, well, you know, there's a lot of understanding of the U.S. and India, and we're trying to increase the number of students who go to India. There are over 200,000 Indians studying in the United States. I think there may be 10 or 20,000 Americans in India who are trying to increase exchanges, uh, trying to increase travel and tourism. I think people hopefully will become more familiar simply through even knowing Indian Americans uh, in this country. But hopefully universities such as Harvard will teach more. When I was an undergraduate, you know, you had China and Japan you studied on uh, with uh, John King Fairbank and Edwin Reischauer. Uh, I think there was maybe one course on Southeast Asia, but I don't recall anything uh, on India. It was just a different era and there needs to be more studies. I know there's a South Asian uh, group here and uh, that's going to happen. So I, I think it will take time. Uh, it's a complicated country. You know, it's really India's many countries rolled up into one. You go to different parts of India and you feel like you're in different uh, country in, a, in, in different places. So uh, even studying it from a distance is not the same as spending time there and really getting uh, to know it. Um, hello, thank you for your talk. I'm Bella from the Harvard Kennedy School. Um, I actually have two questions. So the first one would be, because you mentioned about like the population, and obviously China and India has a, huge, a lot more population than other countries. And in terms of like right now, the aging issue, I think especially for China, but true in India as well, like the aging population and also like the elderly population. So how would you forecast like that would be like a future challenge for the two countries and if there's any similar lessons that we can draw, you know, in terms of like economic development or um, social development, and especially I think China and India are the two countries who are investing a lot more on the science and technology sector, so, you know, AI and all the um, tech sector, so especially that would create more job, like job opportunity laws or any other concerns, so how would you, um, like forecast that to be a problem in, term, in the future for the two countries. And then the second one would be, because you also mentioned the um, China-Indian border issue, and especially it started as like 1962, so almost like 50, like 70 years um, till now. So how would you um, think about this issue in the f future and how would that impact or escalate the two countries' relations okay. and um, the decades? Thank you. Uh, let me try to give, relatively short answers because I know others have questions uh, 
as well. It is true that the population is growing in both countries, although uh, China is less so because it had the one-child policy. India's population, I think, is expected to peak out at maybe 1.7 billion. Uh, obviously, as countries become uh, with a rising middle class, you tend to see a lowering of the uh, birth rate. But no, India recognizes that it needs economic growth uh, for, uh, to feed the population and to keep people who are young uh, having the availability of jobs rather than having sort of social unrest. And so this is a high priority of uh, the government and something that uh, uh, they've done well on. But it's very challenging when you have such a large population, as I said, even growing at 6% may not be creating enough jobs uh, that you do. But it's a, an issue that the, the, the uh, government is very cognizant of and is trying to have growth policies to support it. China is an authoritarian country, and so it's less clear how they're going to do it. And as I said, right now, <laughs> they're experiencing an economic slowdown because of some of the government decisions uh, in terms of the relative weight given to the private sector as opposed to the state-owned enterprises. And that's going to be a challenge that they're going to have to figure out uh, how to deal with. Uh, the other question was, the second question was? The uh, border what? issues. Oh, the border issues. Oh, look, this has been a challenge since uh, the countries were created. There's been a undefined border. Uh, in 1962, the Chinese moved over into India. In part, I think there was uh, residual uh, displeasure with India giving uh, uh, refuge to the Dalai Lama. And there's concern in India that uh, Indian territory is abutting China in strategic ways. Uh, but they had reached this agreement on sort of where this line of actual control was and how they could patrol on each side where they disputed the territory but had protocols for uh, not interacting in a way that caused the conflict. That has been upset by what's happened in recent years. And as I said, they built, built in permanent infrastructure and have extensive troops there in ways that are not good for uh, resolving the issue. The Indians have said we need to, you know, they, they've been able to de-escalate in the sense that the troops are not literally facing each other uh, and avoiding a clash, but they haven't been able to, you know, sorry, they've been able to disengage, but they haven't de-escalated and pulled them and pulled them back. And they've been negotiating 20 plus rounds uh, of efforts to do this. More recently at the BRICS summit, Prime Minister Modi and President Xi met on the margins. This was in August of this year and announced further accelerated efforts to de-escalate. But shortly thereafter, uh, there was an official map published uh, by China that included in it territories that India regarded as part of its country. The state of Arunachal Pradesh in the Northeast, China regards as South Tibet, India regards Arunachal Pradesh, and there's uh, disputed territories in the Jammu and Kashmir uh, region. And they can be disputed, but India reacted very negatively to China saying they are officially part of our country, and they didn't feel that was a productive way to have talks go forward on de-escalation. So they're each going to have to realize that it's in their interest to uh, resolve that issue, but the Indians will not warm up the rest of the relationship until they feel that that issue is managed, and the Chinese would prefer to compartmentalize it, but that's, that's been a tension. Did Rob? I'm Rob Perlberg from the Weather Ed Center. A wonderful talk. Uh, Ken, uh, it reminds me of an old international relations theory of alliance formation. Uh, do nations balance against the rising power in the region, or do they bandwagon with that rising power? And most uh, conventional realist thinkers say, well, they'll balance against the rising power. You described uh, India's response to a rising China as mostly uh, conforming to that expectation. I suppose you could say the same 
for other states uh, around the Chinese periphery, including Vietnam and Japan and, and South Korea. Maybe Putin's Russia is the only power that's uh, bandwagoning at the moment, right. but uh, uh, that's, a, that's a peculiarity. Do you think that this, that this uh, pattern, which reassures countries like the United States, it makes it easier for the United States to, uh, to contain China, if you can outsource that problem to all the peripheral states around China's uh, borders, would that pattern change if China moved against uh, against Taiwan? Well, either with yeah. blockade or with military action. Uh, t let me mention two things. Uh, you know, a lot of these countries do not want to be in a position where they have to choose between China and the United States. Uh, and China is so dominant economically. You know, unlike in the Cold War when the Soviet bloc and the Western bloc were really separated economically, China is so embedded in the economies of these other countries that while they look to the United States perhaps for security and want the U.S. to be present to balance China, none of them really want to get caught in between a dispute or to have to say anything negative to China. They certainly don't want to see a dispute over Taiwan. And I think the conventional wisdom is most of them would not want to get involved in such a dispute. Now, the United States, I think, at this point, is understanding of that. And people in the administration have said, either on or off the record, that they wouldn't expect India to be fighting shoulder to shoulder if the United States were ever involved. Others have raised the issue of, you know, if American blood and treasure is being expended in Asia, despite what we have said or, or not, will Americans start to feel, hey, you know, are you with us or are you not with us? And how will that affect relations? And how will the Congress feel about assistance or other support they give to these countries? So that's still very much an open question. But ideally, what these countries would like to do, in my opinion, and maybe I'm being unfair, is leverage the tension between the two to benefit from both. Uh, and you see a lot of countries, you know, saying, you know, what more can we get from China economically? What more assistance can we get from the United States? How do we uh, maximize the position? Uh, but they don't want to really choose or be forced to choose between it. I just got back from Singapore, you know, as a country that has good and close feelings toward both China and the United States. And, you know, they depend on economic trade uh, for their survival. And I don't think they want to see tension, but they want to have good relations with both. And to the degree each of our countries tries to outdo the other in terms of how much uh, support we can provide, you know, that's all to the better, perhaps. But it's a very fluid arrangement, very situation. Thank you so much for speaking. I'm Margaret from the law school. Um, so building off of uh, what you mentioned off of leveraging um, the complicated relationship between US and China, um, and you mentioned the semiconductor supply chain as well. Um, so given the concentration of the semiconductor supply chain in China, Taiwan, Korea, so forth, I know that India has its own ambitions in building out its uh, supply chain. Um, how can India then establish itself as a complementary hub um, to enhance global resilience? And, and what uh, strategies can it employ to utilize um, its, its own vast domestic market, um, similar or different to uh, China's own successful model? Thank you. Well, you know, this is a big desire of India to be a manufacturer of semiconductors and to be, as I mentioned, an alternative supply chain to China. And the United States has endorsed this in the Quad of trying to assist India in this regard. So there's policy agreement on giving India or having India play a greater role in semiconductor production, in manufacturing in the region, and in uh, supply chains. The fact of the matter, though, is still that private companies need to be the ones who make the decisions to actually invest their money. Governments can agree on policy frameworks, 
maybe even provide some incentives, but at the end of the day, these are decisions that companies that need to be responsive to their shareholders and to their bottom line need to make. And so there's the policy agreement, but what India now needs to do is make sure on the ground it can provide the policy framework uh, for these decisions to be implemented and for companies to want to do business in India. Some of that is occurring. I mentioned uh, Apple uh, moving production there. Uh, there what came coming out of Prime Minister Modi's visit. Uh, there was uh, some companies that said they would invest now in India in semiconductors. But India historically has sometimes had difficulty in actually consummating some of the policy agreements. And what will have to remain to be seen is how much these companies actually invest, how quickly it goes. It's not that easy to suddenly become a semiconductor manufacturer overnight. It takes a tremendous amount of technical expertise, uh, environmental issues and the like, and foreign investment. So that's really the question that's open now. There is the policy uh, view that this should be done, but you ultimately have to get the private companies to say we're going to put a lot of money in because these are not small investments that you're making. And the government of India, I think, will try to provide incentives uh, where they can to make this, uh, make this happen. But it's, going to t it's not going to happen overnight. It's going to take, take a fair amount of time. We have time for one last short question. If anyone has a question? Thanks for your talk, Ambassador. I'm, I'm Mitch Presnick. I'm one of the visiting fellows at the Fairbanks Center. So, um, I had a question for you about China and India relations directly. Because they're obvious uh, natural partners, given one has low cost of labor, one has tons of capital to invest in lots of expertise. Uh, do you see any, under the headlines, do you see any uh, flows of information and capital and comity, perhaps a little bit more um, uh, pro-business or pro-cooperation than the headlines we're seeing here. Yeah, there, you know, there had been a decent amount of trade and investment between the two, but with the incidents of 2020, the Indians really clamped down on investment coming in from China, on their concerns about technology in China. India made a decision not to have Huawei be part of its 5G infrastructure. And so right now we're going through, I think, a difficult period to see uh, flows of capital going back and forth or the countries merging their specializations to uh, perform more effectively. Whether that will change over time remains to be seen. I do think that there's been a shattering of trust that will mean that while India will want to have a good relationship with China and not have a conflictual relationship, it won't bounce back immediately if they were to reconcile the border issues. It's going to take some time because, and, and I think that's why we've seen a more robust level of cooperation with the Quad because I think they've concluded that this is going to be a long-term challenge, strategic challenge for them, and so uh, certainly not in areas that are critical to its own national security will we see uh, the type of cross-border investment and relationship that optimally might be what would, one would think would be uh, the best thing to do. So speaking of partnerships, uh, I do want to take uh, the prerogative to extend my gratitude to the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs and to the Mid-Tall South Asia Institute for co-sponsoring today's talk. Um, I want to remind everyone that again next week uh, we uh, have Julian Goodwartz from the State Department who serves as the Deputy China Coordinator uh, here uh, at noon. And finally, please join me in extending our gratitude to Ambassador Juster, not only for an illuminating conversation about the importance of India to what's happening in the Indo-Pacific, but also, uh, as seen here in our front row, uh, to your investment through the Juster Fellows Program uh, okay. and the future of uh, 
making Harvard a continued hub for foreign policy expertise. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you.